All right, so remember when Dragon Ball Super melted like five seconds into its first major fight, and then it just kept getting worse and worse? And even when it eventually picked itself up again, it still couldn't help but keep, you know, stumbling. Well, that's because Dragon Ball Super had one of the most soul-crushing schedules in all of anime with almost no pre-production and proper lead-in time. It's crazy to think that one of the most popular series in the world was held together with a string and a prayer. The fact it was a resounding financial success in spite of all of that is honestly a testament to the power of Dragon Ball more than anything. But Toei has changed. The terrifying cat has turned over a new leaf as of late with a whole new building, a full internal restructuring, and a very different philosophical approach to production. The once meme tier animation studio has been releasing some serious bangers since Super finished, and with a whole new Toriyama adventure on the horizon, it looks like we're about to finally get our own taste of television greatness. And so, here's everything you need to know about Dragon Ball Daima. It's your turn to be destroyed! Did you know that this is reportedly the most Akira Toriyama has ever been involved in a Dragon Ball show's production? And I do mean, ever. Dragon Ball Daima began its life as a totally original toy series back in 2021, but then when Toriyama was asked to provide some advice for the project, he ended up diving in head first, leading to him not only overhauling the story completely, but additionally created and designed, well, almost everything you'll see in the show. Different worlds, characters, vehicles, mechs, there are an insane number of handcrafted Toriyama designs driving this new show. Animators on this upcoming series have even mentioned his unprecedented involvement on the animation side of things, checking over and correcting visuals, ensuring layouts match his vision, the full works. Now, of course, tragically, Akira Toriyama passed away this year, which has led many to wonder about the fate of Daima itself. Was his work finished? What now? But this actually allows an opportunity to touch on one of the most spectacular parts of this show's existence, its insanely generous production schedule. After toying with the show for a while in 2021 through pre-production, the team at Toei created a pilot in early 2022 as a sort of proof of concept for Shueisha and Toriyama, with it being the very first time a Dragon Ball anime has tried to present Toriyama's modern art style to the world. At this point in the production, the actual plotline of the show was already largely mapped out, all in an effort to test this bold new direction as well as ensuring that the sense of wonder, adventure, and breathtaking new lore was present throughout. As Toriyama himself said on Daima, quote, It will be a mix of different things, and not just intense action. Now, I love action as much as the next guy, and given that this is a Dragon Ball series, it will have a wide assortment of combat, no doubt. But for me, Dragon Ball has always been more than a simple one-trick pony. The elements of magic, hilarity, heart, and adventure are not just parts of the story's history, they are the very foundations to its success. And with this series fundamentally being a celebration of the series for its 40th anniversary, we have a lot to look forward to. And if our sources are correct, that means we have one hell of an adventure to the demon realm, coupled with an oppressed nation, Majin shenanigans, and all kinds of creepy Kaioshin plotting. And, well, once the feeling was right and the plot finalized, they were granted a green light from the powers that be and thus began assembling an incredibly skilled team tasked with bringing this story to the world. And this, this is where it gets really interesting. If you cast your minds back, you might remember that back in the day of Dragon Ball Z, you'd have some episodes that looked beyond terrible, and others that were basically straight up the peakest shit you've ever seen in your life. One of the all-time GOATs from back then, delivering so much of that very good stuff, was a guy called Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru. This dude was next level insane and so amazing at emulating Toriyama's style that not only do fans mix up their work constantly, even to this very day, but Toriyama himself kept confusing his own work for his. Nakatsuru wasn't just one of the greats in Dragon Ball Z though. By the time the Boo arc rolled around, he had risen to the role of character designer. And if you're like me and notice a difference in how Dragon Ball Z was drawn between Cell and Boo, well, that slight shift in visual design is thanks in large part to none other than Nakatsuru himself. Even as Toriyama's style started to evolve over the years, Nakatsuru continued to evolve with him. 
The pair's styles are inseparably intertwined, and yet, in spite of this, Nakatsuru's involvement on Dragon Ball has been pretty low-key over the past two decades, only animating a few short, rather inconsequential scenes here and there. But now, with Daima, Nakatsuru is not only back, but he is back once again as character designer. That means translating Toriyama's design work into animation-friendly versions, complete with full expression sheets, posing suggestions, the works, right? And based on the very little we've seen of the show so far, it truly does look like Toriyama's art come to life. And what better way to honor what may very well be his final contributions than in such a perfectly faithful manner? But of course, one man can't define the look of a show alone. Everyone draws a little bit different, animators aren't all the same level. And that's why animation directors exist to redraw stuff and keep things looking great all the time. Over the course of modern Dragon Ball, there have been several big names that even people not interested in animation know. During Super's TV run, it was Yuya Takahashi, the man who showed up big time in the Tournament of Power and wowed everyone, and I do mean everyone, with his old school artwork and spectacular animation. With Dragon Ball Super Broly, it was now Hiro Shintani, whose design work completely overhauled the look of the series and reinvigorated it with fun and loose energy that had been sorely missing. And with Dragon Ball Super Superhero, its design work and spectacular 2D opening brought in One Punch Man icon, Chikashi Kubota, who seriously turned heads with his insanely polished sequences. Now, if I told you that they were all chief animation directors on Daima, it would probably sound like a list some fan might have cooked up as a dream scenario. And yet, this is the actual reality of it, along with several other talented people like Super's Miyako Tsuji, and Dragon Ball veteran Takio Ide, Daima is sporting an indescribably powerful top-level animation squad. But ultimately, what is really setting up this show for success is that production schedule I mentioned earlier. If you're not aware, most TV anime only have a short string of episodes finished by the time it hits the airwaves, and after that it sort of becomes a game of churning out episodes at a fast enough clip to stay ahead of the air dates. It's a pretty stressful situation and one that has led to many an episode only being just finished maybe 24 hours before it's due. Or in some of the worst case scenarios such as Jujutsu Kaisen's 17th episode in season 2, it aired totally incomplete instead forcing editors to try and edit around the continuity gaps for it to make some sort of sense, with it finally being finished only for the Blu-ray release months later. This lack of proper production time is ultimately what caused the mess that was Dragon Ball Super in the first place. The show started airing with almost no buffer at all. Seriously, commencing with less than a handful of episodes close to completion. Some of those weren't even done yet. And so the entire staff spent the next, well, I don't know, three to four arcs desperately trying to keep their heads above water, trying to put out episodes in time for release, with them in the end only really ever managing to reclaim a little bit of a buffer once they devised a large string of low demand slice of life episodes before the Tournament of Power. Daima's a different story. Daima has been in full force animation mode since mid to late 2022. And by the time it hits the air at the end of 2024, it will have had over two years of full pre-prepped animation. And based on our sources, it's already got over 16 episodes in the bag, which is just completely unheard of. I mean, that's the same level of pre-production something like Mob Psycho gets. Now think about that, right? If the show has 20 episodes fully completed by the time it starts airing, it would have a buffer of roughly five months if the show were airing weekly. This is well over double what most shows are allotted. To put it simply, not only does Daima have the best chefs, but those chefs, they have time to cook. Holy fucking shit. But, okay, I hear you, right? Uh, what about the writing? Why should I care about this thing? Super gained an insane amount of popularity, and with its manga now several arcs ahead of the anime's ending, a lot of folks were hoping for a continuation. The marketing so far has definitely been, well, pretty nothing. We saw some creepy-looking dudes, some kid characters, and Goku beating people up. The animation is cool for sure, but let's be real, all the most exciting stuff is coming from insiders dropping hints about what the plot and tone really is. What we can know for sure, however, is who's actually heading up the writing for this thing. 
If you're not aware, TV anime have something called a series composer, which confusingly has nothing to do with music and is somewhat similar to the kind of showrunner roles you see in Western properties, but much more hands-off creatively, if that makes any sense. Game of Thrones' TV series, of course, spawned from George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, but it's David Benioff and D.B. Weiss who crafted that into each 10-episode season, until it exploded in a whirlwind of disappointment upon its conclusion, but my feelings of Dumb and Dumber's self-sabotage aside, showrunners typically don't write every single episode. There are other scriptwriters, and instead they exist to consult and guide those other folk along the way, making sure the story, tone, character arcs, etc. all come together and remain consistent. In Dragon Ball Super, for example, a guy called Atsuhiro Tomiyaka took Akira Toriyama's outline for the Tournament of Power arc, expanded it, and then mapped out how that would play out across its 54 episodes. But the episodes themselves were written by him and eight other people. The individual dialogue, the way characters are characterized, that's all formed from those writers. Of course, Super Schedule meant any real attempt at consistency in characterization between episodes went right out the window, but hey, that's how it works on paper, okay? Don't blame the messenger. Daima's writing is being led by a woman called Yuko Kakihara. She's worked all over the industry for many, many years, and I think maybe her most beloved writing comes from Kids on the Slope, a series from Cowboy Bebop director Shinichiro Watanabe. When it comes to writing for old existing properties, she's also the lead on the Yurusei Yatsura reboot and the Digimon Tri movie series. To my shame, I've not seen any of these, so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on her work in the comments section down below. My team tells me Kids in the Slope is incredible and the Yatsura reboot is super faithful and fun, but I do know that Digimon was pretty divisive or at least I think I do. For me at least, I'm actually not super worried about her position, as we've all heard Toriyama was so involved with the production of this show that it seems pretty explicit he would have overseen the scripts too. I mean, he spent so much time overhauling it and writing lore for it, it's hard to imagine this wouldn't have been the case. Unlike Super, a series he famously complained about in the Dragon Ball 30th anniversary book. Yikes. From the many interviews Toyotaro has given over the years, Toriyama was a real stickler for ensuring the comedic lines were perfect, so if nothing else, I'm sure this thing will be packed full of the fantastic humor we know and love him for. And given its clear throwbacks to early Dragon Ball with the return of Kid Goku and the Nyoibo, that all sounds like great fun to me. For many years, we've all joked about Toriyama's napkin notes being paraded around as groundbreaking input, but this time it seems like things are different. Almost everyone on the production unanimously says that his involvement was genuinely extraordinarily deep, and I think that adds a lot of weight to the project's legitimacy. However, writing is really not what tends to define an anime's total experience. It's actually the direction. Choices like giving Ultra Instinct a vocal theme, the rain and flashing lights as Trunks finds Gohan's deceased body, the choice to engulf Vegeta's scream in the overwhelming sound of the explosion as he sacrifices himself. All of these major creative choices spawn from the director and they are so pivotal to a show's quality. Good writing can be presented in a boring fashion by a bad director, but a good director can take any quality of writing and elevate it to new heights. Across a lengthy TV production, each episode ends up directed by a different person and the quality of those episodes tends to depend very heavily on who's at the helm. But anime also has a higher directorial role, a series director. They helm the entire project, they nail down every single creative element presented to them, the color design, the music direction, they oversee everyone's storyboards, making corrections where necessary to bring it in line with their vision. Dragon Ball and One Piece fans have both seen what a series director can do to overhaul a show. Tatsuya Nagamine completely 180 the look and feel of Dragon Ball Super with the Tournament of Power arc, and he did the same thing again with One Piece's Wano arc. It's a powerful role that offers huge creative control. But concerning Daima, it actually comes with two series directors, and they both could not be more different. The first is Yoshitaka Yashima. Huh, where do I know that name from? Oh, yeah. Mmm, okay. <laughs> that name might very well not mean anything to you, and I wouldn't even blame you. Yashima isn't even really a director, or I guess he wasn't? Until now, surprise! <laughs> Most Dragon Ball fans would probably know him as the guy who draws entire episodes all by himself, and they always look... kinda funky? No offense, Yoshitaka Yoshima. But actually, over the past decade, he's been taking on the storyboard role more and more often. It's not uncommon for animators to try to move to directorial roles after dabbling in this field, but to go from animator to series director without so much as a single directorial credit under his name... 
it's kind of insane to me. But actually, by the sound of how things panned out, it all kind of makes sense. It turns out Yashima is actually really good at realizing Toriyama's wishes, and coming from an animation background has meant he's been able to produce assets for the staff that are completely invaluable and almost unheard of in other productions. For example, in episodes with many different viewpoints all spread out across a large region, it can be hard for staff to work out where everything is spatially, based on a storyboard and script. So instead, Yashima drew out a map of the area on paper, labeling where all the characters are and what they're doing. Even for background artists, his above average artistic skills have allowed him to sketch out environments and camera angles beyond the strengths of most directors. It's offered a clarity and mutual understanding seldom found in these kinds of animation productions. And if he happens to lack a vision for more creative aspects like lighting and musical direction, well, Daima appears to be in luck because the other series director is a woman with obscene talent and a vision that has seen her rise to the ranks over the years and become a fan favorite. And that person is Aya Komaki. Having spent 11 years on One Piece, Komaki truly came into her own on the show, directing spectacular episodes like Luffy facing up against the three admirals in episode 474, the Whole Cake Island musical in 875, and even the big samurai reveal in Wano in 909. Her episodes have truly stood out over the years for their stunning emotional beats, creative ideas, and iconic colors. It's landed her the role of co-series director for much of Wano, and she went on to direct all of the musical segments of One Piece Film Red, arguably the most iconic looking parts of that movie, mind you. Her eye for composition is unparalleled, and I think it's so interesting to have someone whose strengths lie in character work lead a tale that's typically put action at the forefront of the story. It all totally lines up with Toriyama's assurance that there's a lot more to this tale than kids punching one another, though. Like I mentioned, the heart of Dragon Ball for me has always been in its ability to land those emotional moments between the combat. Krillin's death in Dragon Ball, Piccolo's death in Z. The emotional impact of those moments and the stellar way they're directed on the screen is a core facet and important counterpart to the combat. But hey, the action is also a great part of the show and we know for sure that great animators like Naotoshi Shida and Sanda are on board with this project, so we're in good hands in that department either way. And interestingly, Komaki's husband is Dragon Ball veteran Kazuya Hisada, who has not been seen on this series since... Check's calendar... 2008! This man was maybe the single greatest animator in all of Dragon Ball Z and... look. I know it probably won't happen, he hasn't worked on Dragon Ball in like a bajillion years, but if ever there was a chance for him to return to the series, surely it would be when his literal wife is helping helm up the show. Let me believe, okay? With all of this said, Yashima and Komaki just seem like a real powerhouse duo on paper. One with a genuine understanding of animator workflow and planning, and the other a creative force to be reckoned with. It's pretty crazy to look at who's involved in this project and suddenly start to see the all-star production Daima appears to have. The passing of Akira Toriyama caught everyone off guard and a byproduct of that is that Daima's significance feels greater now. To the best of our knowledge at this time, this is the last Dragon Ball project to feature his major input. And it's somewhat poetic in a way that it appears to be a show very literally calling back to Dragon Ball's roots. A young Goku going off on an adventure to lands unknown to him making friends along the way and conquering the strong guys that stand in his path. Daima's production team were already giving it their all and making great use of a dream production environment, but I'm sure they feel the pressure even more now to deliver on the franchise creator's final creative wishes in the best way they possibly can. With everything that we've covered today, it seems like this may very well be achieved and then some. Ultimately, there is never a 100% certain way to know whether any creative endeavor will succeed or fail. But at the least, this show has every single tool, asset, creative behind it to make that success as likely as possible. Really, the only element that we don't have decades of reference for at this point is Toriyama's own contributions to this new story. But I think I can speak for a lot of people here when I say that I have faith in his writing and his vision. He is, after all, the sole creator of Dragon Ball, the anime that changed the world as well as my very life. I honestly cannot wait to share in the fantastic community energy that comes with weekly Dragon Ball when it begins airing in the fall. There's really nothing quite like it, so I'm excited for all those out there that are new fans that haven't gotten to experience it yet. And I'm sure that final episode is going to hit exceptionally hard as we say farewell to not just this series, but Toriyama-driven Dragon Ball 2. 
The far future of Dragon Ball may very well be a cloudy unknown for now, but its near future is one to seemingly be very excited for. I've been Mark Fitzpatrick, and I'll see you guys next time.